good evening everyone a very welcome to all of you for this session so we have today with us representatives from isb hcc paris shulik and smith business school of uh, maryland smith university of maryland smith and we are all here to address your queries we will talk about the individual universities but we would also be happy to address any other queries you may have related to your mba education your gmat preparation uh, mba admission requirements uh, country specific information etc etc i hope all of you have uh, at least you know you leave with some new information after this session at the very outset i would uh, thank our panelists today vijender amit balbinder manish thank you very much for taking the time out of your busy schedules that to on a sunday to help our students with the information i'm sure you 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 have fun too in the process right so um let's so we're going to be here for about an hour hour and a half so let's try to have as much fun as possible so at uh, the very outset i would like request the panelists to introduce themselves uh, if i start introducing it will end up becoming a monologue so let's uh, make it more interactive so balbinder why don't you go first and introduce yourself to the audience Balbinder, you can unmute yourself. It's not happening. Wait. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, this is Balbinder. I am uh, right now an MB participant at HEC Paris, a class of 2021. Uh, the specialization I would be taking is strategic marketing, uh, which would start in September. And uh, given my background, I am a design graduate from. National Institute of Fashion Technology Hyderabad and I had been working with exports and retail into lifestyle and apparel industry for almost 6 years and yes uh, I'm looking forward today to interacting with you or if you have any queries thank you thanks balvinder we hope to hear more from you during the session Our next panelist, uh, Mr. Vijender Trivedi, from Shulik School of Business at York University. Uh, Vijender, uh, I would request you to introduce yourself to the audience. Sure, thank you. Hello, everyone. Hope you're doing well and staying safe. I am Vijender Trivedi. Uh, I actually graduated from uh, Shulik MBA program back in 2011. I've worked and lived in Canada for almost nine years. very recently moved uh, to india and of course started supporting um, and representing shulik uh, i am responsible for recruitment admissions and i'm also the associate director for the hyderabad campus here in india so back when i was in canada of course i've worked in multiple industries uh, retail banking uh, ngo as well not for profit and uh, however my business function has always been marketing So very happy to be here glad to be here and I'm looking forward to a very interactive and a great session thank you It's a uh, actually good fortune that you came to India before the whole covid 19 thing uh, shut down the international travel so I took the last flight from Canada to India so you can imagine how... Yeah yeah so glad that you are back home with your family always helps Of course thank you Uh, next may I request uh, manish bansal who uh, is the, who heads the india operations of university of maryland robert smith business school manish yeah uh, hi everyone i hope everybody is doing good and families are doing great so i represent university of maryland in india as managing director of india operations we have team here we started operations indeed last year december uh, itself so it's only 4 5 months i am the lm of the university I passed out in 2002, which I did on sabbatical from SEBI. So I have been in the industry for almost 25 years now. Uh, different roles, different organizations, including SEBI and City Bank, and you know, the, the, and I have done different innings every after three years in my life over the last 25 years. Uh, right now, also uh, in addition to representing university, I run a couple of businesses. uh you know including one platform which is country wide platform for for corporate business solutions so that's that's where it is and i am looking forward to 
interacting with all of you today and see if I can add some value with my accumulated knowledge, experience, uh, and obviously, you know, whatever I have done till now. Thank you very much for, for inviting me here in this particular session, and I really look forward to add that. Thank you. Thanks, Manish. So this is actually the first time that uh, UMD uh, Smith has participated in uh, Jambori's MBA seminars or webinar this time, obviously. Uh, the other schools on our panel, they have been our regular visitors or regular panelists. So I hope you have, uh, you have a good time. Thank you very much. I look forward to that. Thank you. I appreciate it. And last but not the least, uh, we have uh, Amit Tyagi, who is the Associate Director of Admissions, uh, Digital Marketing and Branding at ISB. Uh, so Amit, uh, can you uh, introduce yourself? Uh, of course, everybody knows ISB. Uh, ISB needs no further introduction. <laughs> But we would definitely like to know more about you. Sure. So uh, I lead the PGP program at ISB, admissions for the PGP one year program at ISB. And I have over 14 years of experience in K 12 as well as higher education. I have earlier worked with Next Education and uh, 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 MBA from IIM Calcutta. I have done my engineering from uh, NIT Kurukshetra. And I'm very happy to be here to be part of this uh, panel and look forward to interacting with all of you and answering your queries over the course of the session. Uh, thanks, Amit. Thanks a lot. All right. So uh, uh, some of you are not Jambori students. So we let me take the opportunity and uh, introduce Jambori as well. So we have been in the industry since 1993. Uh, therefore, by default, we are the oldest and largest study abroad organization in India. Actually, we used to call ourselves study abroad uh, purely because earlier GMAT, GRE, SAT, these exams were not accepted by universities in India. But the things had changed a lot in the last uh, decade or so. Now we have universities like you know ISB and the, some of the IIMs, etc who do accept the GMAT score uh, for their MBA programs. So yes, so in actually we can call ourselves that we cater to uh, students who want to go to any university which accepts the GMAT score. I think that's the right way to rename or like not necessarily rename, rebrand ourselves. We have got uh, 39 physical centers in 22 cities and four countries. We also have very strong online presence. We have a strong digital learning platform. So we launched our digital learning programs in 2012 and we have been doing it for eight years now. That's the reason when the lockdown happened in Mar on March 22nd, uh, we could start go online from the very next day. We did not lose out or we did not cancel even a single day, uh, day's class because our faculty were already trained to teach online. We had the setup, we had the infrastructure. So uh, luckily, you know, we could, our students did not miss out on even a single day's class. So all our programs have been running uh, online since March 22 and um, we will continue to run online as long as required. Uh, or whenever the government decides to let coaching centers open the centers, right? Uh, some data points that we are extremely proud of. Uh, more than 30% of our students score 700 or more on the GMAT. And uh, we have been maintaining this since the very beginning, since, like 90, since we started out. And we have been able to get this every year. This is one of the targets that is given to the faculty team. Um, uh, we get the best GMAT scores in India. We have been doing that since 1993. You can also say that probably because we teach in volumes, maybe that's where we get those. Whatever the reason, this is a data point and, uh, and I'm proud to uh, share this with you. Uh, as for myself, my name is Orzuma. Uh, you will see the that the pronunciation is different from the spelling. The spelling is has a Y, but it's pronounced as a, a Z or Z. So my name is Orzuma. I have been with Jambori since 2007. I started out as heading the admissions counseling division of Jambori. Uh, then I moved into operations and verbal training. Currently, I head the verbal academic team at Jambori. I head the uh, expansion efforts and also the operations. Uh, so you can say that, you know, because I have been here for so long, uh, I get to wear so many hats. Uh, hats. And I'm, uh, I feel fortunate that I get to wear so many hats. 
So um, that's about us. That's about me. That's about the panelists. Now let's get down to business. During the session, uh, use please use the chat feature only when we ask you to do so. If you while a panelist is speaking, if you char uh, if you start uh, posing questions on the chat, obviously the panelist will not be able to respond to those questions. So wait till the panelist is done and then start uh, start asking questions, right? And my request to the panelists is that uh, please uh, check out, keep on checking the chats. If there is any question related to the, your university, please address it in the chat. Right now, I have the chat feature switched off. Initially, when we let us first get done with the information that we want to give out, and then we'll, I will open the chat. Uh, there is also a raise hand feature, which all of you used in the beginning when I asked you to. Right now, that is also disabled. Uh, the objective is that let us first get done with the information that we want to give. A lot of your questions may get addressed while, when the uh, panelists start uh, speaking about, uh, you know, about the universities, etc. Okay, so these are some ground rules for the session. Uh, webinars are a little difficult, of course, because you know you are sitting alone. You are not in a in a group in a seminar hall, right? So let's follow these rules so that uh, all each of you you get the best out of this uh, session. I will go and talk a little bit about the admissions criteria. These are you know uh, doesn't uh, it's irrespective of which business school you are looking at. All this all these business schools, you know, they have these admissions criteria. So if you are very new to GMAT and the whole process or MBA process, then it helps to know uh, what the admissions criteria are. What are the things that universities take into consideration before deciding whether to give you an admission offer or uh, to reject you? Standardized test scores, the GMAT, uh, TOEFL or IELTS. Now GMAT, uh, a lot of the business schools nowadays, they also consider the GRE by the way. So if you want a list of business schools that accept the GRE also, you will get the list and on, on the official MBA website, mba.com, right? So GMAT or GRE, uh, a language test, depending on which uh, country you go to. If you're applying to ISB and your medium of instruction has been English, obviously you don't need the TOEFL, the language uh, test. But if you're applying to a US university or a Canadian university, then you may have to take a language test as well. So once you have decided which universities you want to go to, please check out the language requirement. Right? This language requirement is very subjective. It depends, it differs from university to university. So do check that out. Don't just prepare for the TOEFL just because somebody told you that you will need a TOEFL score. Uh, freeze your university shortlist and then decide whether you have to take the TOEFL exam or not. Your academic record, uh, except ISB, some of the Indian uh, business schools, they want your 10, 10, 12 records, but universities outside India, they, uh, they don't uh, want your class 10, 10, 12 marks. They want your bachelor's degree and beyond anything that you may have done after your bachelor's degree. So that's the meaning of academic record. Now, academic record is a challenge, obviously, that probably you can understand. Uh, in India itself, the grades vary a lot. Somebody with a BA English uh, honors, for that person, a 65% is really good. But somebody who has done an engineering, the 65% is probably average, right? Not, not that good. Now, the it, uh, grades also vary from university to university. So if you take the example of the engineering degree only, a Nagpur University or a Pune University, with a 68, 70%, you are the topper for sure, right? But if you go to an IP university or Anna University, Andhra University, then uh, you, know, you, you have to get a 19, 95% for to be the topper. So there's a lot of variation there. You know, that's why this standardized test you know, score is very important. Universities get to compare candidates directly. Uh, 700 on the GMAT is higher than 670 on the GMAT doesn't matter which country you are from doesn't matter what your academic background is you know that's the meaning of standardized uh, uh 650 is lower than 680 so the universities don't need to ask need any more information to uh, you know to, uh, to decide which score is higher therefore this the gmat score you know um holds a lot of lot of importance uh, in addition to that you know work experience or internships 
once upon a time, five, six years ago at least, you know, work experience, you, you know, it, it used to be a fact that to get into a good university, you should have a few years of work experience. But that piece of information is changing quite rapidly. ISB itself used to have a, you know, a two-year work requirement for their MBA program. But in the last few years, they have started the YLP program. Uh, they have the early entry program for people you know, with less work experience. So universities are becoming open to lesser work experience, right? So uh, if you hear in the forums or your friends saying that you must have work experience to get into a good business school. So that's not necessarily true. Again, shortlist to universities and then check what the work experience requirement. Extracurricular activities, very important. And by the way, this also happens to be the area where Indian students lack the most, right? They do good scores. They usually, you know, have a decent academic record. Uh, work, ex everything is fine. But extracurricular activities is where they struggle, right? So do think about this part. Then essays and letters of recommendation, they form a part of the final application process. The online application of the universities would have these two components. They vary from university to university, obviously, right? Uh, universities may need one to 10 essays. I have seen some European universities like INSEAD asking for 10 essays, right? uh, it varies also. Oxford asks you to write 2000 word essays. So, um, you know, the essays, how many you need, et cetera, et cetera, that will depend on which university you are applying to. Letters of recommendation, again, some universities may want one, some may want two. Handful of universities also ask, uh, also ask for you know, three letters of recommendation. So this also, once you have finalized your universities, check out the requirements thoroughly. It's not a, a blanket statement that you will need three essays or you will need two letters of recommendation. It's not that you know, uh, simple. Uh, in my experience, 95% of the universities will have an interview round before giving out the final admission offer. There are some universities which do not need the interview round, but that those are very few and far between. So uh, interview round is the, usually the last step. You know, once you submit your applications, then based on that, you get an interview call. You can get rejected before the interview call also. And uh, some selected students get the interview call. And after you go through the interview process, uh, that's when you get your final admission offer. Now, interviews also vary university to university. Uh, on our panel, we have got ISB. ISB has a panel interview. You would be interviewed by more than one person. Uh, some, uh, everybody else on the panel, they have a single person, one-on-one -on -one interviews, right? So the uh, type of in interview also uh, is, is different. Like if you apply to the IIMs, you know, the Ahmedabad, Bangalore Day programs, then they also have panel interviews and the style is different. A couple of universities like a Richard Ivy would have two rounds of interviews, right? So again, very, very university specific. So these are the admissions criteria. The reason why I want you to think about this admissions criteria is that very often students get fixated on this. They think, I have a 700, so I will get admission in XYZ college. Or I get lots of questions that, um, what GMAT score will I need for X university? What GMAT score will I need for Y university? So, uh, but it's GMAT score is not the only thing. All this thing, you have to work on the rest of your profile as well. So if your strategy is that, uh, let me first get the GMAT score, and then I will decide what to do with my profile, then that's not a very bright strategy. Okay, so please uh, get on the right path uh, right from the beginning. So today's session, after today's session, I hope you will start seeing the whole admissions criteria in a, like in a more, take a more holistic view towards it rather than, rather than you know, getting fixated on some exam scores. Okay, so that's, uh, that's all I wanted to leave everybody with before I uh, ask the universities to uh, come and introduce their business schools. So students, please pay attention uh, to our, one by one, our in, uh, the universities on our panels would be introducing their uh, universities. So um, I would uh, request uh, Vijender to go first. So Vijender represents, uh, you know, York. Uh, and uh, Canada has been one of the most soft, sought after destinations uh, among Indian students in recent times. So Vijender, why don't you go first? 
Okay, perfect. For some reason, I don't know why I keep uh, getting muted, but uh, thank you, Orsma. Um, hello, everyone. Hi again. So what I'll do is I'll quickly share a screen and we'll go from there. Great. Can you see my screen? Let's type yes or no. Uh, yes, we can. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So thank you again for being here and, and I'm glad to be here. I just wanted to share a couple of things and give you a brief overview uh, about Shuli School of Business, our programs, MBA, MBA in India, and our IMBA program. I think one of the first things that uh, as you know, student or aspirant would look at is uh, ranking and branding. Right, so what I want to start off with is uh, Shulik School of Business is ranked number one uh, MBA in Canada and is among world's leading uh, B schools as well. So we are ranked number one by, as you can see, a lot of um, ranking agencies, well-known agencies, The Economist, Forbes, Corporate Knights. And I picked two of these rankings just to tell you why we are ranked. Right, so Forbes, we are ranked uh, number one for years to pay back. So, um, once you graduate and you get a, your dream job, you'll be able to pay back your uh, student loan in less than three years. And uh, we have been consistently ranked number one for that. The second one that I would pick is Corporate Knights. We are ranked number one in Canada and number two in the world for um, sustainable business, responsible business, because um, sustainability and bu responsible business is something that's core to us. And uh, this comes from you know, the way we teach the triple bottom line, people, profit, and planet. So those are the two ones that I would pick. But again, as you can see, we're ranked number one uh, uh, by other really well-known global agencies. The question that comes up is why? Why number one? So three things. One is we are global, we are truly global. So with, uh, when I say campuses uh, in five plus countries, what I mean is that we have uh, three physical campuses, uh, two in Toronto and one in Hyderabad, and we have satellite centers. We have partnerships with 80 plus management B schools, management schools, and 31,000 alumni in 90 countries with 93 chapters. So yeah, as you can see, we are truly global, our presence, um, is across, you know, it's not just North America or Canada, it's across and, uh, and that's why we are ranked number one. The second reason we are ranked number one is uh, because of our innovative programs. So we have 18 specializations and 100 plus courses that you could choose from and uh, you're truly able to customize your learning and map your goals. There's one other thing that's unique to Shulik and that is a real life consulting project. So in term three and four, you work with a real client to solve a real business problem. And I'll go through that, uh, in a, I'll chat about that in a few minutes. The last but not least is diversity. We all know that businesses are global these days, right? So you will end up working with people from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different countries, and surely prepares you for that. So we have more than 50% of our classes international more than 60% of faculty is international. And it doesn't stop there. We have exceptional program diversity as well. For-profit, not-for-profit, and public sectors. So these are the three reasons why we are ranked number one. The other thing that you get with Shulik, the other advantage that you get with Shulik is, uh, is the Toronto advantage. Right. So as you know, you, you know, Toronto is one of the most diverse and best cities in the world. 55% of Toronto's population was born outside of Canada. And Toronto is one of the best university cities for international students. With everything that's happening in the US, a lot of companies, major companies are moving their operations north. Right? So Toronto is not saturated just yet. It's booming. It's booming with startups. It's booming with other opportunities. And, and that's why. And if you look at it from an opportunity standpoint, we are ranked number three in the world. And I can imagine, like, if you are moving to another country and if you are choosing Canada, you would want to live and work there after your MBA. So 
the other you know um, things that i have highlighted here become even more important and that is safest metropolitan city in north america and last but not least we are ranked among the top five livable cities in the world so with Schulich, you get the toronto advantage as well very quick program at a glance and i'm sure you know when you go to our website you'll find this on our website but i'll quickly go through and highlight one thing that i really want to here is uh, build first year you will build a solid foundation so your business fundamentals you'll fine-tune your problem solving skills you will touch all the functional areas of business second year is where you'll acquire real world experience and this is unique to surely eight month project so this is where what i was telling you earlier a live consulting project so you actually work with the client to solve a real problem and it's not a four to six week quick uh, project that you usually uh, would do this is an eight month long so you meet with top management from an actual firm for every other week so you'll be presenting to top management you could end up presenting to your ceo of the firm so i think that way is you're building your network you're also finding your um, communication skills and of course consulting uh, as such is super important when you're doing MBA. And last but not least, uh, you will differentiate, explore and specialize. So we have, like I said, 18 specializations that you would choose from. You can also internationalize your MBA even further, right? You can opt for study tours, internships, short programs, exchange, whatnot. So Schulich has a really flexible MBA and something that you are able to customize. So three programs that I would like to highlight are regular MBA in Toronto, and we have a January and a September start, full-time, part-time, and of course, two campuses, a Kiel campus, which is north of the city, and then downtown campus. So this is our regular Toronto program. The other program that I'd like to highlight is our MBA in India program. As mentioned earlier, we are innovative in, and we come up with innovative programs. So this is one of the programs that we actually launched in 2010, and this is a dual economy MBA. So you do your first year here in India, and then you move to Toronto in second year, you integrate with the Toronto batch, and you graduate from there. And I'll not go through this in detail. Uh, if you are interested, absolutely, you can reach out to me. But there's something I want to highlight, and that is our India Advisory Board. As you can see, you, we have some renowned business leaders on our board, Mr. Ratan Tata, Mr. Uday Kota, Mr. GM Rao, um, and, and others that you can see here. So we have a really strong advisory board. You will get to hear from a lot of them uh, during your first year here in India. And I always get asked again, so this is super quick, year one in Hyderabad, year two, you move to Canada, year two is where you do your strategy field study, then you explore career opportunities in Canada, and then you graduate in May or June, and you continue to work in Canada. So, and you, of course, get a regular Schulich MBA degree. It's just the, the dual nature and the dual economy MBA that gives you best of both worlds. And I always often get asked, what, what are the benefits, like why? So two important economies. So you get global curriculum here in India and you gain access to corporate world. It's a small cohort, right? Excellent access to faculty. So it's more than just academics, it's life lessons. And you build a global network, like I said, uh, business are global these days. So it's good to have network uh, both here in your home country and in North America. Cost, you get uh, a financial aid uh, towards your first year tuition fees if you choose this program. And of course, the cost of living is lower here in Hyderabad. So we call it best ROI MBA as well. And last but not least is our IMBA, International MBA. It's a small cohort, 30 students, um, and of course, focused on international business. And the actual strategy field study is also international. So it's not um, in Canada or Toronto, it's outside of. Uh, so if you are interested, again, you know, feel free to re reach out to us and we'll be happy to share additional information about international MBA program. So I think something that's super important for you to know is that from day one, you gain access to a really strong support system in place. So we have a career development center that works with you from day one. So you gain access to coaching, so sector-based career coaches, advisors, individualized advising and coaching, 
tunes, of course, because you know we're coming from South Asia and North America. You know, of course, culturally it's a bit different. So soft skill development workshops, those details are important. So we help you prepare for that. And networking, as you must have heard from uh, your other schools and other representatives, uh, or in your research, that uh, networking is how you get your job in um, in Canada or in North America. So we do have on-campus recruitment events, year-round corporate networking events, whether it's a breakfast session or a fireside chat or a regular networking event. You will, of course, you know, gain access to our alumni network as well. So Career Development Center is with you from day one to help you succeed. And uh, super quick, and again, this report is available online, but I thought I'll give you a snapshot. The best way to remember this, and again, this is for class of 2019, 90% hired within 90 days of graduation, and average starting salary is $93,000. And again, you'll have to look at it from a Canadian lens. Uh, because of course, you know, if you compare it with the US, the numbers would be different, but uh, you, you know, I would strongly recommend that you use a different lens when you review this report. And our top, of course, industries are financial services, telecom, technology, and consulting. That does not mean you know, um, that consulting, of course, can be strategy consulting, marketing consulting, technology consulting, right? So you'll have to, again, view it in, in that sense. So this is just a quick snapshot um, to give you some overview of how our students perform and how they are placed right after their MBA. Student life, super important. Again, you're going to Canada, a new country. So we have lots of, you know, uh, clubs, industry-based, student interest clubs, cultural clubs, and our graduate business council. And of course, some of the events that actually help you transition well into uh, Canada, Shulympics, um, MBA Games, Dean's Cup. So again, you know, take a look, you know, of course, um, you know, our website has a lot of information and of course, in best interest of time, I wouldn't get into uh, details of each of these, but uh, this is something that, uh, that uh, our students enjoy and benefit. So they actually connect, engage and, and network uh, using uh, the student life and clubs. And what I'll do is admission requirements. Again, I, I don't think I'll go through this because it's uh, um, already um, Orzana explained it to you, but uh, super quick, three to four year, uh, three or four year undergraduate, competitive GMAT. What I'll say is TOEFL IELTS, it's not required. Um, just like, you know, I'm sure ISB doesn't need this. So we don't require this as well, because if your medium of instruction is in, has been English, then uh, we waive this. So that's, that's for the language test. But what I want to leave you with is, we look at every application holistically. So everything is important. We have rejected people with 770 GMAT, and we have accepted people with 6, 600, 610 GMAT. So it's about, you know, your holistic application, right? Your strong professional references, why you want to do MBA, what are your post MBA goals, extracurricular activities. So what do you do on the side? You know, what is your personality? What is it that you bring to the table? Right. So again, you know, don't apply for GMAT and then worry about these things. Do it in parallel. And I'm sure you'll be able to submit a strong application and deadlines and stuff. Of course, you can review on our website, but uh, currently our winter intake is open and our uh, round two deadline is July 29th. And if you're thinking about fall 2021, then uh, here are the deadlines. But again, all of these are available uh, on the website. Tuition fees, I will go through it and I'm sure we'll be touching this later in this webinar. But um, as next steps, yeah, please feel free to explore our website, attend our events, email us, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'll be happy to answer any additional questions that you have. Thank you. Thanks, Vijender. Uh, so next, uh, may I request uh, Manish to talk a little bit about, you know, uh, about your university? So what I would do is, uh, indeed, ma'am, I will run that video, which is for three and a half minutes or something. And yeah, yeah. then probably there are general questions I can take up because video generally covers literally everything. So I'm just sharing this. Yeah, just, yeah. Uh, just a um, moment. So uh, attend uh, students, if you have any questions about York, please uh, start typing them out in the chat. And Vijendra, I would request you to address the students' queries about York. Yeah, we'll do. Thanks. Yes, Manish. Please go ahead.
<laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I think uh, the whole video covers all dimensions of, uh, you know, a college or, or, a, or a university in which the students look for. So if you look at it from the student's perspective, what you're looking for is number one, the great quality faculty, which can broaden your thought process, which can expand your thinking horizons, which can add to your perspective and your knowledge base. So I'm, I'm very happy to say, which you would have noted, we have 150 plus faculty members uh, and around 50% of them are the international ones. So that's the first part. Second is the infrastructure. I think infrastructure wise, the University of Maryland College Park is one of the best, right? And in addition, there are three more campuses and one campus we run in China. We do not have any facility of running the program in India as of now. And we do not intend to at this point in time. Then in addition, if you see the quality of the, you know, the, the location, the Washington DC is one of the most prominent areas you see a lot of public sector places, including the IMF and the World Bank of the World. Then you have a lot of KPMG and the ENY kind of consulting organizations warehoused at the Washington proper. And then Amazon has recently announced that they will be setting up their second headquarters at Washington. So the, the work is, you know, as I understand, is starting very soon. So probably in a year or two, they will be available for the students to basically recruit from there, uh, from, the, from the campus, uh, which is available next to them. Uh, if you look at it beyond it, in terms of the quality of life, otherwise Washington being what it is, and Baltimore is around you know, uh, 90 miles away, uh, you have you know, New York, which is like you know, uh, maybe the four, four and a half hours drive. So you have actually a location which is very close to Wall Street, uh, which is very, very prominent countrywide. The powerhouse, obviously, in the U.S. is the Washington. So if you see all these dimensions, they are very, very good. If you look at, obviously, I'm not giving you too much of the statistics, but all that is available on the website of the campus that, you know, we, in addition to the MBA, we have very, very specialized one-year programs or 30-credit programs, which we call the MS. In fact, today we have MS in almost seven streams and they are very, very popular among Indian students. Uh, in terms of the placements, we have seen the track record and you can go to the website and check that. I'm not you know, bombarding with that information or we can share the presentation with Jamburi and Jamburi can you know, in turn forward that presentation to all the participants. I think we have been very, very good on the placement track record side. You would have also seen the 60,000 Surukal alumni across the, across the world. In India, we have around 50 alumni already connected with since I took the charge in December 2019. And we are helping each other in Surukal placements or creating the cross-functional opportunities for each other. So that is the way we are trying to build the, the Smith School. Uh, and I think it is one of the very interesting choices for the students if they want to basically go for either MBA or maybe the specialized MS. I will stop there. And if there are specific questions, I'll be very happy to take them up later. Thank you very, very much. Uh, so Manish, uh, let me address the elephant in the room. You know, uh, Given the current scenario, there's a lot of uncertainty about international students going to the US. So, um, you know, I mean, the, uh, couple of days ago, the whole thing came about, you know, the international students uh, going, asking the government, asking them to leave if their classes are online, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. what's the situation with uh, the Smith Business Schools? Are the, uh, is the fall semester moving online or uh, is it going to be in person? And to, uh, the attendees, the students uh, that we have uh, today, do they have to keep, keep anything in mind if they're considering US, you know, as a whole, as a destination? Sure. So what we have done is we have already taken the decision, ma'am, to make the fall 2020 hybrid. So if you look at the entire order, executive order, which was passed, right? They said you have to vacate only if it is pure online, right? So what we did, we said, look, we, you know, you can take more than one or two or three courses online. Even if one course practically is one-to-one -one or face-to-face, -face, 
that is treated as the hybrid. So we have already categorized our, all of our courses hybrid, uh, depending upon the, uh, the, the ability of the school to accommodate students who can, who can come to campus because we have to ensure the social distancing norms, etc. So a room which used to accommodate, let's say 70 students can only accommodate 15 to 20 now. So 15 to 20 probably will come to the college and remaining will join the program offline. Uh, which essentially means, uh, you know, on, on the computers online, essentially, and then probably the next batch or next batch will come. So we have to work in that manner. We have already taken the decision that all of our programs will be hybrid. Uh, the students have the choice if they can reach us, they can do the program uh, in the hybrid manner, or we have given the choice to students for fall 2020. If they want to just go online totally, they can join the program online and for that they don't need visa, they don't need I-20 right now, and they can later join in the spring or maybe even in fall 2021. So we have all the choices given to the students. Um, what kind of scholarships uh, do you, uh, you know, think will be available to international students who will be uh, you know, going to, let's say, planning to go to Smith you know, for the fall 2021 session? Uh, there is also another uh, fear, which I mean, I interact with students every day, and they say that, this year, uh, because a lot of students may defer their admissions, and uh, so next year, uh, it may will it make the will it make getting an admission more difficult? You know? So the, both these two questions, <clears throat> what is your take on that? Yeah. So let me take the first question first. You are absolutely right because we gave the choice to the students to to either join online in 2020 or defer to the fall 2021. And we have seen that good number of students have already, you know, kind of deferred their admission. Now, deferring admission means that if we had, for example, let's say 150, 100 seats or 80 seats, right? If let's say 20, 30 of, of or 20, 30 percent, 40 percent of them are already filled, there will be the less number of seats available for the next fall 2021. And to that extent, probably competition among the students will be more because we do not want to hopefully dilute the value of the program by increasing just the number of seats. That will not happen, right? So for sure, probably it will become more competitive next year when the people want to go next year, right? That was the question which you raised. And what was the second question? Sorry, I missed that part. If you can raise it again. Uh, no, that, that was uh, related to that, you know, so that um, in terms of placements, etc., how would that play out? So placement, etc. doesn't make a difference because the number of the seats remain exactly the same. Yeah, what is becoming difficult probably is the internship part because as per the immigration laws, you have got to be there for the nine months or the two semesters before you do the internship. If people do the, let's say, fall 2020 online and join in January for the spring session, hopefully things become better, they will not be completing the immigration requirement of two semesters being in the US before they can do internship, right? So internship is becoming difficult in the, in the summer 2021. What we are doing is we are evolving a mechanism to engage the students in a productive manner, which means that we are trying to explore the experiential projects. You know, for example, they can do research, you know, finance guys can do research on equity research on companies or industries or we can engage them in some of the consulting projects, which probably the professors are running in some consulting power, maybe entrepreneurship projects, you know? So we are working on those nitty gritties and the, and the, you know, the situations, how we will evolve, but that will be the only thing challenging. Baki, everything else is available. For example, OPT is available. Everything will be available. I, I don't see a challenge there. So uh, actually my other question was related to scholarships, but since you say yeah, that the yeah. class size would remain the same, so the chances of uh, you know, getting or not getting scholarships would also remain the same, right? So, no, so let me just put that slightly in the perspective. See, school budgets or the financial awards budgets are actually approved a year back, right? Uh, so what happens is that for the 2020 fall, we already had the budgets, we have allocated the budgets to people and awards are given. But if they postpone it to fall 2021, we are telling that continuously to students, right? Because this year budgets will get approved now. And we think and we believe that, look, the budgets will be slashed dramatically. Not here with us, Smith, 
I think we are hearing that across the board because state uh, states really are you know in, into the deep issues with regard to the available capital. So if the budgets get slashed, right? So if people are joining in the fall 2021, clearly there will be more competition for the available lesser resources, right? Even we are not committing to the students who are postponing or who are deferring their admission to fall 2021, what kind of awards they will have. If you have $15,000 or $20,000 award today or $30,000 today, not necessarily you will have the same awards. We will be reevaluating every student right and taking a decision upon that basis but the chances are that the existing ones who are deferring will probably have the priority because they are already there in the system right and the fall 2021 applications are starting now so based upon that the decision will be taken but very difficult to say what will happen uh, but one thing is for sure there will be more competition for the available skills resources thank you thank you so much manish uh, so gender uh, What's the, what's the situation with uh, Shulik, you know, are with the flights, you know, not getting uh, available till like Ju July 31st, etc. So how will it be the class uh, that, is that is supposed to start from fall 2020, you know, how is that impacted? And in case people have taken, def taken deferments, so um, how will it impact the class coming in for fall 2021? Do they, ex should they, be prepared to, uh, you know, prepared to see more competition? So what I would say is um, right now, the university and the school has taken decision to go completely online. So fall 2020 classes will be delivered online. Uh, and of course, a decision has not been made for the winter and of course not for the fall 2021. So we're going one step at a time. Um, so fall is completely online. And uh, the other thing that uh, the sh uh, school is doing is, of course, they understand that uh, students are impacted and COVID is something that's impacted everyone. So uh, both university and the school has come up with additional bursaries and scholarships to help um, students navigate through this as well. So that's something that I thought I should highlight as well. And just from a winter 2021 standpoint, as you, I, I don't know if you know many of you, uh, I, and I would encourage you if you are planning to um, apply to Shore Lake and if you want to move to Canada, you know, you should follow Canadian news. So what the government is doing is they're already at unlock 2.0 and they'll be unlock 3.0 very soon. So things are moving in the right direction. Of course, I don't want to give a super positive this thing, but uh, things are uh, slowly um, improving. And Shulik is also looking at uh, considering um, hybrid model. So of course, there'll be lots of rules and restrictions and regulations around social distancing, how many people can sit in a class, uh, how many people can you know, actually enter the library. So there are those, but uh, once the government gives us permission, to, to do that in-person experience or classes, we are ready uh, with a hybrid model as well. So do your classes or quick lectures online and then come to the school and, and do your in-person activities. Uh, but again, that's not final just yet. That's what we're thinking for Jan 2021. So I, I don't know if I'm okay and if we have time to play a video that actually talks about the power of remote. No, actually, you know, I think uh, we are, let's, let's wait, let's uh, go around the table and if we have time, we'll come back. Perfect, perfect. So that's all. Like, those are the two things that the school is currently doing. Uh, but again, if there's any additional information, uh, I'd be happy to provide if, if anyone wants to reach out to me. Okay. So uh, request uh, to the students, if you have any, qu any questions about York, any questions about uh, Smith, Please keep on typing those out in the chat window and I would request uh, Manish and Vijender to uh, keep responding to the chats uh, about your universities. Any questions that may come in the chats regarding your universities, please keep addressing them. Thank you so much. So um, now we'd like to uh, go to ISV. So Amit, if you're there. So Amit, why don't you introduce ISV? Yes, so I'll just share my screen. Sure. And quickly run through because I understand we are uh, short of time now. Okay. So, uh, welcome to this presentation by, uh, on Indian School of Business. Uh, 
Uh, as you all might be aware, ISB was established in the year 2001. And in a sh short span of less than two decades, we are now among the world's uh, most reputed B schools. And this journey of the last 20 years has been a journey of many firsts. So we were the first B school in India to offer the one year program, a format so successful that it has now been replicated by almost all the other top B schools in India. We're the first B school in South Asia to be uh, accredited by ACSB. We're the first B school to offer the modular programs. And we were among the youngest B schools in the world to be ranked consistently among the top 30 B schools uh, globally. Uh, so when ISD was uh, being established, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel, but we wanted to learn from the world's best. And that's when we uh, chose Kellogg and Wharton's to be our founding associate schools. And they shared the curriculum and uh, knowledge with us. They helped us in building the institution. And as we continued in our journey, we, part we wanted to be, uh, be strong in research, uh, focus on research uh, aspects of the management education. And that's when we partnered with London Business School and MIT Sloan School of Management for their uh, unmatched expertise, for they are among the world's best research focused B schools. And going forward, we partnered with the uh, Fletcher School at Tuft University, uh, which has uh, uh, unmatched expertise in law and legal environment. And that's where we get our expertise in public policy from. So all our partner uh, schools have helped us build the institution, have helped us uh, uh, frame our world-class curriculum, we have faculty exchange with, with all the uh, all of these uh, partner schools, and this has resulted in us being recognized among by um, the world's best accreditation agencies. And we are now among the world's only hundred B schools who have uh, uh, acquired the triple crown accreditations. So we are now ranked by the top three accreditation agencies in the world: ACSB, Equus, and EMBA. And we also are now ranked uh, globally as number twenty-eight in FT MBA Global Rankings twenty twenty. So I just want to. Uh, talk two aspects of ISB before I uh, play a video and uh, end this presentation. The first one is a, a world-class portfolio model of visiting faculty. So at ISB, we have 70 plus teaching research faculty at uh, who are resident or across uh, both the campuses in Hyderabad and Mohali. And apart from that, we have something called a portfolio model of visiting faculty. So when I say that, what do I mean is we have a pool of more than 200 plus faculty from top global school B schools who don't just come for a one-off lecture, but they visit ISB and take a complete course, spend a term at ISB and off, take a complete course for our students. So prime examples will be, we have uh, Mr. Chris Subramaniam, the uh, current chief economic advisor to the government of India. He takes a course at ISB. We have Mr. Edward Rogers, who is a chief knowledge officer at NASA. So he spends a term at ISB and teaches uh, managing business complexity. So you learn from the world's best academicians and practitioners right here uh, in the heart of India. And these are some of our other visiting faculty from the top B schools uh, that we have. We have people like Madan Pilutla, who is from London Business School, who teaches uh, 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 conflicts and negotiations, and so many others. Another aspect that I want to talk about at ISB is the placement statistics. So we, among the Indian B schools, we have a, a, a unique model of placements. So we have our own in-house team of uh, 28 professionals who work across regions and uh, geographies and bring opportunities to our students on our campus. So we have a large cohort, a diverse cohort. So last year, out of the uh, 880 students who were part of the cohort, we were able to get uh, 1504 offers for our students and more than 220 plus companies visited our campuses. More importantly, we are ranked number fourth globally in terms of salary growth. That is your increase in average in outgoing salary versus incoming salary. That's uh, we are ranked uh, globally fourth. And another thing at, about placements at ISB is that uh, we are known for providing quantum shifts uh, uh, in career uh, to our uh, 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 candidates. So if you look at this uh, figure on the right, the uh, we last, last year's cohort, 79% of students have had a functional shift. That is moving from, let's say, uh, marketing to a, a, a finance. And we had around 78% uh, of our uh, cohort had a industry shift, maybe moving from, let's say, uh, marine engineering to consulting. And 65.28% of a uh, cohort had both functional and uh, industry shifts as part of the placements at ISB. So we are known for the quantum shifts which we provide to our cohort in terms of the uh, careers. Now, to talk further, I'll uh, let our biggest brand ambassadors of alumni speak to you for uh, uh, three or four minutes. I have a small video which uh, where our uh, uh, alum speak to you. So. Let's hear them out. For me, one of the 
of the most inspirational moments in my life was when I watched Leander Pace win the Olympic bronze medal at the 1996 Atlanta Olympics. To see him stand on the podium, to see him win that medal, to see the Indian flag going up, to see that tear rolling down his cheek, I think was really inspiring. And at that very moment, I decided that I wanted to play for India at the Olympics. And uh, yeah, that was the start of my thing. My time in the US was when I was first exposed to the internet in a really big way. I still remember opening up my Gmail account when I was in university and it had been about 15 days since it happened. And it was a lot happening around that because just right after the dot-com bubble, uh, a lot of new business ideas were coming in to far more cautious. Well, I remember the moment quite clearly sitting at my desk at Goldman Sachs, this would have been 2003, and as an equity analyst reading a tremendous amount on both China and India and the opportunities that this part of the world presented, and knowing that these are big and complicated markets, and, and knowing also that the only way to really gain context and understand was to be in them, I quit my job, put on a backpack for the next year and a half, and I traveled extensively throughout Southeast Asia, Asia, and in India for about nine months. During that time, I traveled via trains, uh, north, south, east, and west, to try and gain an understanding of this country, and was struck by the extraordinary opportunity, both professionally um, as well as personally. Personally, when I think of Groupon, uh, I think this is perhaps the best shot I will get in changing the way Indian consumers engage with the internet. Olympic Gold Press was founded by two of India's sporting legends, Geet Sethi and Prakash Padukone. The mission of OGQ is very focused to help Indian athletes win Olympic medals. Uh, all of us have been athletes, all of us have been through the grind and we have been frustrated that the talent was there but the support system never existed. And that's what OGQ aims to do. We aim to bridge the gap between where Indian athletes are currently and where we need to be to help challenge for Olympic medals. So Spada is an early stage venture capital firm operating in India focused on what we call essential services. India has a very vibrant venture capital ecosystem. But much of that money is focused on technology. We fund nuts and bolts businesses operating at the last mile, which are critical for improving livelihoods and we think very important to the continued growth of the backbone of India. Everyone in my world knows this. The one year at ISP completely changed me as an individual. The biggest learning experience has been from the entire group environment, uh, be it in study groups, be it uh, with your classmates, uh, be it with your bodies. Here I was like this linear science guy with just one unilateral perspective and suddenly these multiple dimensions come in. All coming from uh, diverse backgrounds, one was an entrepreneur, one was a sales guy. One was a typical IT geek, and the other guy a sportsman. When I look across the broader early stage funding ecosystem in India, I find entrepreneurs, I find venture capitalists, I find people in the startup community from across the ISP batches. There is a tremendous amount of entrepreneurial activity that comes directly out of the school. In fact, the first deal we did out of Espada Investment Advisors was found via the ISP networks and negotiated right here in this room. When I look at my year, uh, years post ISP, I think two things really change. One is my ability to take risk. I'm a lot more confident and as an entrepreneur that is extremely important. Uh, and second is uh, the network. Uh, the ISB alumni today is spread across the entire world, almost every company that you can think of. And as an entrepreneur I know that these alumni of these companies are either my future clients or my future service providers. That for me is the ISB. and a mother to a one-year-old, ISP for me was the answer to the question, where can I go for world-class business education without really compromising on these initial very special years with my daughter? For me, it was the perfect bridge back to India. I don't graduate uh, with my degree only, but also with my business plan.
And one thing that I used to really teach you is to be humble. When I walked in, I was like this big guy. And then I studied with one guy is an army major, 21 years of experience. The other guy is an IIT Delhi grad, ninth rank. And the third guy is a national level footballer. And when you look at myself, it's just a run of the mill charity. To learn by doing, in short span, life altering, life changing, inspiring, immaculate, change the status quo, exhilarating, prioritizing. I'm ready to be transformed by IIT. So that's all uh, from my side. I'll be happy to take on questions now uh, from the audience. Thanks, Amit. Uh, uh, Amit uh, and the, uh, the other panelists also, uh, please post the videos in the chat. So if any of our students, if they were not able to view it because of internet connectivity or anything else, they can then view it them. You know? uh, so the ISB, ISB video, I, I have seen it probably every year since 2010, 2012, you know, but uh, it's always inspiring. So uh, everyone, I would request you to do uh, to watch it, uh, to watch that. So um, next, uh, last but not the least, I would uh, uh, request uh, Balvinder. Balvinder. Yes. Uh, yes. Hello, uh, everyone again. Uh, so today I'm here uh, to present HEC Paris. Uh, uh, HEC Paris is very old school uh, now. Uh, in terms of their grand école and master in management programs. Uh, MBA is relatively new. Uh, we are celebrating the 15th, like golden jubilee year uh, for MBA program. It has a history as a school, as a university and a legacy. Uh, CEOs for most of the companies in 500 fortune companies in the world has a uh, most number of CEOs from HEC rather than any other B school around the world. Ranks, HEC has been ranked one of the top institutes by almost every uh, agency or report, uh, Financial Times or Economist. Uh, this year we were able to make in the top 10 for Financial Times ranking. And in Europe, it is considered to be one of the best schools. Uh, NCI is definitely there, but uh, HEC is more towards diverse career profiles and industry expertise. Uh, HEC is not only for MBA. When you come here, uh, you have a lot of opportunities to do, do different courses, specializations, uh, certificates. And uh, due to COVID-19 uh, situation, uh, Coursera has, been, uh, has opened many opportunities for HEC students to do uh, many certificates and courses. If you are free or you have time, you can do them. And believe me, those are really good uh, courses. Uh, coming to the specific points of HEC MBA, it's 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 highly diverse program. You have uh, more than 14 nationalities coming together. Uh, every year, it is increasing. Uh, the batch size is very small. You have two intakes from September and January, and the total cohort goes around 270. The cap is at 300, so they do not want to uh, increase the size because they want to make that experience more individual, more focused, and more specialized. Uh, the alumni network is one of the largest in HEC Paris, and it's very efficient. Uh, networking opportunities you have because Wherever you are in the world, you will find an HEC alumni and you can frankly just go on the platform and contact that person if you are having any questions or any guidance. So in that terms, HEC alumni network is very, very strong. Uh, talking about the MBA experience at HEC, I would like to share one video with you guys, uh, which tells almost everything. And if you have any other questions, I would be really happy to answer those. The skills that we need today. So, are you guys able to listen to it? Uh, 
is it audible and clear uh, yes it was okay i'm from india i'm from brazil i'm from new york i'm from morocco i'm from Lebanon. i'm from shanghai and i'm from benin we have more than 60 nationalities we have 93 percent international participants you're meeting so many people from all around the world i've never lived in such an international environment coming here exposed me to different cultures different perspectives different views i think through all of that is a lot of mutual understanding also a lot of friendships that get built they're also coming from a breadth of different professional backgrounds what this means is that you get to take advantage of their experience they learn from you and you learn from them and when you get there are all these different people with all these different background we create real new propositions our class size is capped at 300 students you're not in an auditorium with 200 people you're in there with 50 55 students and then you form really deep bond with people who work around you and that's something that HEC offers uniquely i think we've given all of the benefits of a two year program in 16 months so the ability to transform personally professionally but also not to take so much time away from the workplace. You kick it off with a fundamental phase, so all of those courses that you need to understand business as a whole. One of the unique parts of the HCC Paris MBA is that you can customize your MBA. So in the second half of your MBA, you're able to do an exchange, an internship, an MBA project, and or a specialization. The business world is changing at an incredibly fast rate. The MBA has actually prepared me to be incredibly versatile. Because the skills that we need today and the skills we need tomorrow might be vastly different. We have a very rich and fully integrated leadership development program where we have workshops or sessions with inspirational leaders, but also also practical activities and projects that students can develop by themselves to test the leadership skills. And that is the largest MBA gathering in Europe. Every year, students from over 20 different business schools gather on our campus to compete in a series of different sporting and networking events. So we were welcoming 1,500 people on the campus. So it's a huge project, actually, and it was intense and challenging. And it's a great way to get to know people from other MBA programs. And on top of that, we have a unique partnership with the Military Academy of Science. Here. The group helps you to overcome your fears because we had to do some uh, challenges we thought we could never do. It's very easy to read a case about a leader and analyze what they do right or wrong. It's quite a different thing to actually do it. We're looking for candidates who strive for excellence. We want people who have proven their marks through their professional career or their academic achievements. They're exposed or like to be exposed to multicultural context, diversity, who have professional experience. Most importantly, we want people who are willing to learn and to work very hard for 16 months to be part of one of the best entry programs in the world. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, there are two, two, three things I would also like to add as the faculties, uh, faculties for HEC, every individual faculty, especially for MBA programs are highly experienced. Uh, they have had elaborate uh, uh, experience in their ex respective fields, projects, and they had been associated with MBB companies uh, and uh, we had a certificate uh, speaker who was a personal assistant to the Lai Lama. That is just for an example. You get to meet, uh, learn from the best of the, of the world. And the second is uh, the kind of students come from uh, different backgrounds is very, very enlightening. You have a chance to interact uh, as a colleague, uh, somebody from nonprofit, somebody from healthcare, somebody from fashion and lifestyle, somebody from newspaper printing. Uh, Amazon and all these big companies, students, uh, sorry, uh, uh, ex-employees come together and uh, smaller entrepreneurship. Uh, a lot of uh, students we have who have had their own business and they had been running or just took a break to complete an MBA here. Um, uh, the third and the most important thing, MBA is more about a people job. Uh, you do need to know the technical background of the company and the product you are dealing with, but it's more about leadership and uh, taking responsibility. And uh, it is made kind of mandatory at HEC that you have to learn your uh, leadership skills and you have to earn those credits as a subject. You have to initiate different uh, representations uh, in marketing event for the college 
or take responsibility of academics or different kind of clubs. Uh, so that's the, they try to make you uh, stand on your own toes and make you so individual and independent that you know what you want to do with your life rather than uh, just uh, following the crowd or herd mentality, uh, which, which I found it very enlightening uh, after coming to HEC. Uh, and I really appreciate it here. Um, thank you. If there is any other question in terms of admission criteria or anything, you can just ask. Right, right. Thank you so much. So um, thanks to all the panelists for giving information about their uh, universities. We can all, uh, we can see the passion with which you talked about your universities. So that is always great. And, um, and that's, you know, and I also, it's good to note that for whether it's for York or for UMD, we have got alums who are now representing their university. So that is, again, it shows that the strong alumni network, the strong bonding that you end up having with the university. So that's really uh, good. So, um, so attendees, so the, we are now starting the Q&A session, some ground rules for the Q&A session. Uh, if you have any question, then uh, raise your hand. The raise hand feature is on now. Uh, when you raise your hand, I will give you mic access so you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Please state clearly uh, who your question is for. And um, if your mic is not in working condition, then uh, please don't raise your hand. Continue to type your questions in the chat window. All right, so uh, anybody, any questions? Please raise your hands if you have any questions. Uh, yes, Anirudh Shinivas, so you are the first person to go live and ask your question. I've given you mic access. You can unmute yourself. Yes, are you able to hear me? Yes, I am. Yes, uh, so I have uh, I have the question for Mr. Vijayendra for the Shulik School of Business. Okay. Um, so, uh, hi Vijayendra, it was uh, nice to get some insight regarding uh, the MBA program and aspects related to it. So I am planning to attend, uh, I'm planning to apply for it for the uh, fall of next year, uh, for the fall semester of next year. And one of my questions is, um, you had mentioned that 90% of the students would get um, employment within three months after graduating. So um, is this 90%, does this include uh, specifically MBA related jobs or is it, uh, or is it just any type of job that they are hired after they graduate within three months? What does that 90% include specifically? Yeah. Thank so, you. Yeah. Um, sorry, I was jumping in. Did you finish your question or do you have a problem? No, no. Uh, yes, that's my question. Okay, great. So 90% is post MBA. So all relevant uh, post MBA jobs that they've applied for. So we, we send out a survey and uh, they reply back to us. And that's how we collect the data, of course, from students, but also from employers. And that's why when I shared the snapshot, it actually listed uh, the industries that, we, uh, that they um, actually went into, right? We also have a graph that shows the business function. So I can okay. also I can always share the link to the report to uh, give you more details. And again, like I've always, I've been typing this um, and I always say this when I, you know, conduct a webinar is uh, please feel free to reach out because I know there's so many assumptions and this thing that you'd have uh, as you're thinking about applying or as you're thinking about moving to another country mm -hmm. and we mm -hmm. are here to help. So, um, you know, I've shared my email, uh, please feel free to reach out or you can reach out to admissions at sholik.yorku.ca. We also do profile evaluation. So if you have any um, concerns or uh, around GPA or uh, work experience, you can always okay. submit your profile for evaluation. We'll be happy to get back to you. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else has any questions? Please raise your hand if you have any question. Yes, anybody, any question? Please raise your hand. I hope you can see the raise hand feature in the chat window. I mean, uh, on, the, on the portal.
so uh, riddhima there is uh, there is a question from riddhima balvinder you might want to take that uh, her question is that uh, what are the admissions criteria for uh, hcc uh, paris okay um, thank you riddhima for your uh, question uh, ad admission criteria for mba is uh, minimum work requirement is 2 years but the average is always high and specifically when you are coming to in, uh, to do an mba your past experience and learning is very 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 much valued so ideal work experience is considered around 4 years there are people who have like 8 to 10 years or, or of experience but 4 years is the uh, standard 4 to 5 years is uh, like a gold spot and uh, it would be an added advantage if you come from a different background uh, it's a little unfortunate for indian applicants that most of them are from technology or it background and they have amazing gmat score so their competition is really high and hcc tries really hard uh, to make the whole uh, mba cohort really um, diverse so they cannot have uh, more than a limited number of indian students so that is uh, definitely a challenging point uh, if you want to get into any uh, such university uh, because your gmat score is always high as compared to latam european or american students uh, you have indian students with gmat score of 770 780 760 you have indian uh, students with uh, a score of 680 also but that is different because that person has a very diverse uh, uh, professional background she is a, a fashion designer and a media com communication specialist and she has something very very unique to offer to the whole cohort in terms of experience and whenever it comes to a teamwork so that is very important and recommendations of course recommendation letters are good for everyone everybody provides a good recommendation what is the more, most important point is who is giving your recommendation is it your immediate senior or the ceo of the company you are working for that that creates a difference uh, essays are i think there are seven essays you have to write and they need to be really good uh, when uh, i submitted my essays they were i was i was really happy with hcc essays but when i came here i read few students essays and they were very creative uh, out of the world creativity in essay writing so if you want to make uh, a difference you have to focus really on the essays thank you thanks thanks for the detailed answer balvinder uh, by the way uh, if any of you if you are just starting out you know and if you want a demo class to see what a gmat is like what kind of skills are required etc etc uh, if, if you leave your number in the chat window and just write demo right just write the, your phone number and gmat demo then we will arrange a free gmat demo for you uh, also if you want us to evaluate your profile about which which universities uh, you should be looking at or if there is a, any major gap in your profile etc we'll be happy to do that as well so please leave your phone number in the chat and write uh, admissions guidance so um, we also do detailed admissions counseling we can brainstorm with you about your profile etc etc if anybody needs that information uh, leave your number in the chat window our team uh, will get in touch with you all right so so there is a question from molshri saini so molshri you can um, unmute yourself and ask your question uh, yeah hi am i audible yes we can hear you okay yeah my question goes to uh, mr vijender from schoolish right uh, hi vijender it's been really nice uh, having a presentation from your end and i have got a lot from you so my question is uh, i am talking about personally for my uh, profile i am a btech and a mtech right in it and i'm currently working in a banking domain um, uh, i have a 5 years experience so i just wanted to know particularly that is there any preferable gmat score should i aim for mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you for the question. I think that's a really good question. I'm sure others would benefit uh, yeah. from it well. So again, I'll go back to what I said. So when we look at a profile, uh, we evaluate it holistically, right? So mm -hmm. the first and the foremost thing that we look at is 
why do you want to do your MBA, right? That why is very important to us. So we'll ask you in the interviews, we'll ask yeah. you within the essays, we'll also ask you for it within the, the video essays that we have, the timed ones. Um, but I think why is very important. So even if you have a, a BTEC or an MTEC and five years of experience, I think you know why you want to do an MBA, right? So if you are able to explain and position your application such a way, then I think that that is what we look for. And just from a GMAT score, GMAT score is just one you know, part of application. And like I said, we have rejected people with 770, not to say you should not get, but I'm just giving you a, a you know, a, a good example or a niche example where we have rejected people with 770 because of mm -hmm. course the references were not great. The essays were not great. They just focused on GM, uh, GMAT. That shouldn't be the case, right? So, and we have accepted people with 580 that we have gone down. Uh, oh, okay. 600 because they had really strong references uh, and going back to what Bill Binder said strong references are important because they talk about who you are how do you work what do you bring to the table your strengths your areas of improvement like can you imagine someone telling you actually your areas of improvement so genuine recommendations are important and again all the essays will focus on why so I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I would say a safe bet would be anywhere like our range, our average is 670, but our range is anywhere between 600 to 770. Okay, that's that's wonderful. You have answered uh, my question. Thank you. Uh, Sneha, what's your question? You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes, Neha, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, hi, uh, I have this question for uh, HEC Paris. Uh, so uh, the thing is that I come from a non-traditional background. Uh, I have say about over uh, 14 years of experience and I am coming from a communications background. And uh, so what would you have, I mean, what suggestions and recommendations you have for someone like me who comes from a very, because you just spoke about Indian candidates and the disadvantage they have uh, as compared to others, you know? Oh, well. uh, I, I, uh, I never meant to discourage Indian students. Uh, I'm just saying a reality that Indian students are really brilliant. It's something to be proud of, but when you are talking about a diverse cohort, you cannot have if more than 50% or 60%, only if one nationality representing. And most of the, like, as you also know, our uh, students we have in India are from uh, IT or technology background. Uh, you coming from a non-traditional background communication and media is definitely an added advantage, but it cannot be taken for granted. Your essays, your applications, and your resume should uh, prove that you are a potential candidate. Years of experience, 14 years, a lot. Uh, it is definitely a very, very uh, added advantage, but it can also be uh, one uh, disadvantage if you are not able to uh, showcase within your application that this 14 years has made you a far better uh, professional uh, in your life or as a person uh, simultaneously. So you have to showcase and justify each and every point in your application. Um, I think GMAT score will not matter that much for you. Obviously you cannot take it that as well for granted, but a decent GMAT score uh, would be able to fetch you uh, an interview. And I think uh, you, if you really want to get this experience of Paris and an international environment, you should apply, I think. Uh, I think it would be, uh, if your application, I, I mean, I, I cannot comment without, uh, the details of the application, but if it is strong enough, you surely should get an interview. So Sneha, if you would, uh, would want us to uh, evaluate your profile for SC, uh, HEC Paris, you can please, uh, you can drop your phone number in the chat window. Uh, our admissions team will get in touch with you and we'll see, you know, but uh, if there is any gap that needs to be filled. And uh, I would also like to add like 14 years of experience, you can also look into executive programs. I don't have much idea about it, but HEC Paris Executive MBA program is, I think, world's number one for now. And you can look at that as an option, uh, like as an option for, so you can have altogether uh, to time to evaluate 
where what exactly you want to do and how exactly you want to proceed in your career thanks thanks belinda uh, sangeet um hello am i audible yes we can hear you yeah uh, hi everyone uh, thank you for such a nicely organized uh, seminar it was very informative uh, my question is for vijender from shulek um so let me introduce myself i am a dentist i am a maxillofacial surgeon with 5 years experience running my own private practice um now the thing is that i have always worked for myself i've been self employed so um who would be good references uh, for me to utilize so what i would say is again um, again thank you for the question and nice to meet you sangeet and i think i was trying to answer some of your questions also. yeah and thank you so much for that yeah so basically so what i'm hearing is um yeah, you're an entrepreneur of course your profession is you know medical profession but you're an entrepreneur so we do have entrepreneurship programs entrepreneurship studies as one of our specializations and uh, toronto and and canada in general is very supportive and, and right now canada is booming in terms of startups so if you are thinking uh, in that direction then absolutely uh, we have an entrepreneur in residence uh, chris carter uh, who runs shulik startups so i think mm-hmm. he would be one of a uh, really good uh, references or someone that i can connect you with and i also remember uh, i don't remember his name but um, uh, he was uh, he also had a very similar profile as yours and he graduated in 2015 i believe so let me you know go back and check uh, and thank you yeah thank you very much i do appreciate um i do have another question if i may ask you know who should she take her letters of recommendation yeah Yeah, that was another question that I did have. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, Sangeet's question was, who should she take her letters of recommendation from? Because she has always been her own boss. I think that was her question. Yeah, thank you, ma'am, for clarifying that too. But I do appreciate your offer, Vijay. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good question again, um, and I'm genuinely saying that I'm not saying it for the sake of it. So uh, I think one of the best uh, people would be whom um, uh, your, your patients, your whom you treat, right? Yeah, they can give you the best recommendation. Uh, both in terms of uh, you know the service that you provided, uh, how did you make them feel? Like all of that becomes very important within the service. Mm-hmm. So I think that and and any other partnerships that you have had with any. Mm-hmm. if they are able to provide any recommendation i think that would uh, uh, be beneficial as well mm-hmm. would my guide in my masters program 5 years ago be a good person i'm still in touch with him we're still mm-hmm. so basically we that, that yeah. i did for to yeah we strongly recommend professional references uh, versus mm-hmm. academics but uh, if you are able to position it in a way because again yours is a niche background and and coming from a medical distinct if you uh, if they are still mentoring you if they are your good mentor then um, yes please feel free to uh, add them to mm-hmm. your recommendation and you can submit three recommendations and let us know which ones you want us to choose uh, but uh, we usually uh no may require uh, to professional references so mm-hmm. so sure. sure. thank you so much i i do have another question if i may take up some of some more of your time yeah of course uh, yes um in terms of extra curriculars um i i do have quite a taxing practice and um, i don't get enough time but um i do conduct a lot of uh, charitable camps both um, treatment and diagnostic do they count in any way or form Yes, yes. That uh, that shows that you how you're giving back to the community, right? Mm-hmm. So that's something that uh, that uh, would add to your application and uh, it will make it, your application stand out as well. So absolutely, I would uh, strongly encourage you to uh, mm-hmm. that in your application. Mm-hmm. Thank you, thank you so much. I really do appreciate it, and um, I look forward to connecting with you. So thank you for that. Thanks, Anjit. Uh, all the best. Thank you. Uh, so sangeet if i may also add you know, in terms of a letters of recommendation uh, you can also take as a medical uh, as a medical practitioner who has your own clinic you will have business associates also i'm sure you know people from whom you buy stuff right so you can have one business associate and one client uh, for entrepreneurs it's uh, you know you can take your letters of recommendation from your clients our business associates not your uh, junior staff not people whom you employ 
but business associates and uh, your customers. So Sangeet, um, you know, your patients are your customers. So you can definitely take letters of recommendation from them. Right, anybody, any question? Any, any more questions? I see, uh, I see that the panelists have done a very good job of uh, addressing the questions in the chat window. So thanks to all the panelists for being so proactive and so active in addressing the queries. Uh, so anybody, if you, uh, the attendees, if you still want to ask anything to any, any of these universities, please raise your hand. I'll be, we'll be happy to address your queries. Okay, Anirul Srinivas, uh, I think you have another question. Please unmute yourself. Yes, uh, sorry, actually I meant to ask this earlier, but I just uh, missed out on that. Uh, so this question is again for Mr. Vijayendra uh, for the Schulich School of Business. Um, so actually the thing is that um, I will be getting my Canadian PR in this uh, in the coming uh, couple of months. So I guess my question is that um, once I do receive the PR, what is the deadline for the application for the fall of next year? Would that still be January 29th or can I apply even for the round two and round three and round four? And a follow-up question to that is, will I be considered for um, uh, the local tuition fees versus the international tuition fees once I become the PR holder? Thank you. Sure, yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, so uh, two things. First is uh, application deadline. Yes, you become a domestic student right away. So the moment you get your permanent residentship and you become a permanent resident of Canada, we treat you as a domestic student and domestic student can apply in round three, round four. So uh, we are okay there. The second, uh, to answer your second question, uh, yes, we do have, of course, domestic fees and international student fees. So um, from semester one onwards, you will end up paying domestic fees, which is a lot lesser than the international fees. For example, for some reason, again, you know, not in your case, but if, if someone is applying and um, they don't get their permanent residentship until semester one. So let's say they start the program there in Canada and they get their uh, PR then what we do is uh, we convert you to a domestic student from the following semester. So not in the semester that you received your PR, but the following semester. So let's say semester one or term one is when you received your PR, then your um, uh, domestic fees will be applicable starting term two, the following semester. I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Thanks, Vijinda. So I um, uh, will wait for a couple of minutes. You know, if you have any questions, again, please raise your hands uh, you can, or you can type in the chat window. In the meantime, uh, if you want a demo class for a GMAT or GRE, or if you want us to evaluate your profile for any specific university, or if you want us to help you shortlist universities, please leave your number in the uh, chat window. Uh, our team will get in touch with you. So Damini, uh, 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 I can give you mic access. I think you are probably not able to uh, figure out the reason thing. Okay, so Damini, you have the mic access now. You can unmute yourself and ask the question. Damini Deshwal. Yes, Damini Deshwal, you can unmute yourself and ask the question now. Damini, can you unmute yourself? Okay, yes, uh, Damini, since you're not able to use your mic, please uh, type out your question. And anybody else in the meantime, if you want to ask your question directly to any of the universities, please raise your hand. Okay, Yash has a question for you, Vijender, uh, that once a person has a PR, does he still have to write the GMAT? Yes, yes, GMAT or a GRE is mandatory, uh, whether you're a domestic or an international student. Um, Damini, I have not seen your question yet. Okay, I've, okay now you have seen it. So, uh, she's from a fashion background and has a four-year degree in fashion and has worked for three years. 
all right so i'm waiting for the question in the meantime if anybody has uh, anybody else has any question please raise your hand okay so damini wants to apply for mba uh but is worried because she hasn't seen a lot of students applying for mba so damini uh, you know uh, i mean i we handled a jamboree we get students who apply for mba and we have handled students who have applied for mba even after you know fashion degrees right so fashion work in the fashion industry so um, you are not unique you know uh people who want to get into uh, management you know luxury brand management there are programs like this or even other type of management degrees also you can definitely go for an mba degree so um um in isb amit you know do you get uh, students from people with fashion background like uh, damini you know who want who apply for mba yes we have people from uh, diverse backgrounds and we have people from fashion background in fact one of our uh, recent alums we have featured his story on our website all, or and our social media pages also harshit you can go and look up his uh, uh, background so he had a fashion technology background he worked for a couple of years with uh, arvin lifestyle and then he's done his mba and now he's working with nike so we have every year people who apply from that particular background apart from that we also have uh, people who are air hostesses people who are models who come and uh, apply and uh, they also uh, are able to uh, make the most of the one year at isb and get into corporate jobs so feel free uh, to reach out to us if you feel that you need a profile evaluation or you feel that with that particular background you might need uh, you uh, whether it's suitable to you or not reach out to us on our website and we'll be able to help you out with that thanks amit uh, so manish do you get uh, people from fashion industry or fashion background and working in fashion industry applying to smith you know what uh, we have very large base of students in you know in mba and ms programs and we have the people from all kinds of backgrounds you know i would be surprised to see that uh, people come from the army background people come from kind of uh, you know the non profit organizations so all kinds of all kinds of guys uh, you know we see in our in our mba program. thanks thanks manish uh, vijender uh, damini is interested in canadian university so and uh, she uh, wants to get her profile evaluated and damini uh, vijender has left his email id so you can get in touch with him directly if you want to okay so i since we are not uh, since we don't have any questions so i would now like to go around the table and request the panelists you know to uh, you know to share any parting uh, advice to the mba aspirants who are planning to start their degrees from next year so any parting advice about how to go about you know their preparations of gmat or applications anything that they need to keep in mind so let's start with you manish okay so i will essentially say that don't just limit yourself to mba because there are lot of specialized programs available today uh, for example there are you know for example our university has lot of ms programs and they are very 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 specialized be in information systems or logistics or you know the or the analytics side because these are the emerging areas when you choose a university uh ranking is important but beyond that what is important is that the university has to offer something unique in probably your area of so to call interest where your aspirations lies or you know where you want to make your career be to entrepreneurship or a job that is the way i would leave that point thank you very much manish uh vijender yes. uh, yes um so what i would say is um and i have highlighted this before is focus on your why i think that's the most important piece like uh, once you uh, gain clarity on that i'm sure you your application would uh, look amazing and uh, you will give your best shot uh, and do your gmat so your why is uh, you know treat that as your uh, motivation and the second thing i would say is uh, post covid 
I think uh, doing an MBA and uh, and uh, thinking about uh, how to navigate through challenging times, I think that will become super important. Something that uh, you know most of the B schools would be looking forward to uh, hearing from uh, MBA applicants. What did you do? Did you just sit at home and watch Netflix, or um, did you did you go above and beyond, um, you know, to build your profile? So I would say uh, those would be my two two uh, tips and uh, advice, if I may say so. So all the best and uh, yeah, good luck. Thank you so much. Uh, Balvinder, you have gone through the process yourself as a student. So maybe you can, you know, you can tell them what you did, you know, to uh, what kind of stuff did you take care of to make sure that you get into a business school of your choice? So uh, as we have discussed fashion background, I uh, myself, I'm a fashion textile graduate from NIFT Hyderabad. Uh, it is definitely a uh, uh, very uh, unique uh, choice to do an MBA because uh, you have a tag of design with you. And uh, as the time is changing, when every company and every startup is talking about digital innovation, transforming design thinking and uh, design strategy, product development, uh, being a designer would definitely help you, but uh, you also need to be realist how you want to navigate your career. You cannot, uh, especially when I'm talking about international schools, people come with a lot of experience and that is what uh, is there, kind of becomes a larger chunk of your personality and your career. So it's, it's, it's difficult that if you are coming from a, a data analytics background and you want you just want to get into creative brand management uh, it is challenging it, it it's it's not that it's impossible you if you are able to do the courses and do the internships and projects accordingly you might end up getting what you want after like six seven years of career but it's not that easy it you have to really work hard for it and uh, it's, it's always your uh, decision that how you want to navigate your career. What do you want to do after an MBA, your financial restraints. Uh, according to that, only you should uh, choose uh, your college or your specialization. Uh, there is no one other than you who understands better what you want to do after that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, Amit? Uh, ISB has always been one of the uh, colleges that Indian students apply to. So any specific thing that they should keep in mind while applying to ISB for the next session? So I would say focus on you know, building a strong application. Uh, as Rajinder said, focus on the why of the application. And but most importantly, don't self-reject yourself. So don't think of, you know, I have a different background or whether MBA is good for me or whether, you know, uh, I'll be accepted at, at a particular college or not. Don't uh, self-reject yourself. Look at your strengths. Build a build build a good profile, and then apply uh, early to the college which you college which you want to choose for. Thank you so much. So we heard I heard the word why you know so very very you know um, you know from two of the panelists actually that focus on why you want to do the MBA and go from there, which is actually very very practical advice. Uh, don't decide to do an MBA just because you got a low increment this year or something like that. So an MBA is not a knee jerk reaction. Right? Deciding to apply for an MBA is a process that you will have to be invested in for the next eight to nine months for sure. First while preparing for the GMAT and then while doing your applications, et cetera, et cetera. So take some time, make the decision. And at any point of time, if you need help, just go to the forums, ask alums. This in you know because of social media, you can reach out to anybody you know at any time. So uh, that's all from us. And Jambori is always here to help you. And if you need help with your GMAT preparation, if you need help with your applications, we are here to help you. Uh, you just have to let us know. And uh, that's all uh, from us now. Thanks a lot to all the panelists. Really appreciate you taking out two hours on a Sunday. I hope you had fun. Uh, I certainly did. And um, all the best to everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.